Our third speaker is Karina Wu. Karina is the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of the Lashan Ohlone. She's an activist who's worked on preserving and protecting the ancient burial sites of her ancestors in the Bay Area. Karina is the co-founder and a lead organizer for Indian People Organizing for Change, a small native-run grassroots organization that works on indigenous people's issues that's also sponsored the Shell Mound Peace Walk. And, um, and this group also hosts an annual Shell Mound gathering at Emeryville Mall, where an ancient site was desecrated by development. She's the co-founder of Sogorite Land Trust, a native women-led urban land trust within the setting of what continues to be her ancestral territory in the Bay Area. Karina worked to create the film Beyond Recognition that focuses on the work of creating the Sogorite Land Trust. And today, Karina will be speaking on the campaign to protect the West Berkeley Shell Mound. So let's welcome Karina Gould. Karina, my name is Karina Gould. I'm the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan. Many people know it as Ohlone. And we um, are going through this process right now. Over the last couple of years, it's been this idea of decolonizing our minds and what does that look like. And for our people, it's really taking back our names, our traditional names um, that, we were, that we gave ourselves. Um, not something that was given to us by a colonizer. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, what happened on this land and what transpired not that long ago. Sometimes when we think about colonization, I think we think of something that happened on the East Coast 500 and something years ago. But here in the Bay Area, it's been less than 200 years, really, that the statehead was created, right? And just a little bit before that, it was colonized by, the, by Spanish and by Mexico. And so I, I think that sometimes what happens is that we forget about that history and what that, what that did to people that were here and how that historical trauma continues to um, uh, affect the decisions that people make. Um, not just the Ohlone people or the indigenous people, but the people that are now on our territory. So. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that because I've, I think over the years I've gone through doing a lot of presentations and I realize that I'm coming from an idea that people are where I am at, that they kind of know the history of where you sit and where you're, sitting, where you're at today. So this actually, this land that we're on is from the Romatush speaking people of, um, of this area. This is not my traditional territory. We are in a place called Yolamu. Um, so there was actually name places for, is that okay? Okay, good. Um, that there were names prior to other people getting here. I'm, my ancestors were enslaved here, but we are from the East Bay, what was called the East Bay now. So my ancestors, uh, this is what we looked like. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is that these are our traditional dancers, and our dances haven't been danced here for quite a long time. Uh, we had to go under cover, right? And so these, uh, these dancers represent my family, right? So these are people that are directly related to me. And often when I talk to young folks, I said, oh, there wasn't cameras a long time ago. But these people that came to our lands, they sometimes were artists that were able to take down something so that people could actually visualize landscapes and people and animals and things that folks had not seen in other parts of the world. And for me, these are kind of a double-edged sword blessing and painful things to look at, right? It's because my ancestors were captured and enslaved at these places that are missions that, and people, other people came here, um, that we're actually able to see these uh, images. 
this is what a village might have looked like along the bay a long time ago. We lived in Thule houses. Um, we had canoes. We lived along the water. Uh, and the crazy thing is, is that the same things that are happening today, because as I walked here from Bard, right, I've made that trip, and, uh, you know, not that long ago, my ancestors would have made a trip along uh, out into the bay with a tule boat, right? And I came through Bard, and I walked across here, and I noticed all of these people that were without a home that were sitting on the ground, that were talking amongst themselves, that were ignoring me just like everybody was ignoring them, right? But one thing that happened was that a couple of hundred years ago, there were people that came here and decided that my ancestors living in this way outside what they considered was not good enough, right? And so with swords and weapons, they removed them from these places that they had lived for thousands of years into these tiny areas um, and force them to create their own um, prisons, right? So we were always warriors. There was always people that fought back. It wasn't like folks walked around here, saw these new people coming, and said, oh, save us, right? It wasn't that. It wasn't like the people that discovered this place um, said um, sometimes in their diaries talk about how they found us wandering about. And I often wonder, what does that mean to wander about for thousands of years, living in complete harmony with the place that you've always been on, and to then to be placed in a prison? So my ancestors did fight back, even though the history books aren't told by us. We know from our own stories that we fought back. The missions came with Spanish soldiers. So, so oftentimes it's like these, these missions that many people keep in their minds, like this idea of, uh, oh, what is the word I want? Uh, you know, I often talk about the missions and how, how this, this enslavement happened, right? And people have this other idea of uh, the missions coming and saving the savage. And I think that that's still really in people's minds today that the Spanish came and that these missions were created and that they actually taught Native people how to live on their own land, right? It was like amazing. But when the missions actually came, they weren't actually, didn't have enough people to build these missions. So they gathered people from the different villages close by. And they enslaved them. Once they became baptized, they became the property of this new mission system. I often talk about this with fourth graders. I said, imagine going home today and your parents aren't there and there's someone there that is speaking a language you've never heard of. And in that language, they're telling you, you have to leave your home and you can't speak your language or eat your foods or dance the way you want to or practice religion the way you want to. You can no longer live on the land in the way that you are supposed to. And if you decide to run away, they would send out people from armies to bring you back and possibly kill you. Now, would that be a scary time? And fourth graders are always like, that freak me out, yes. <laughs> so, in a short period of time, that's what happened to my ancestors and California Indians um, from the bottom of California all the way up to Sonoma. This is where the missions um, had been. 21 missions or prisons built on stolen land land that was taken, not given to anyone. No one asked permission to be here, right? They took what they wanted. They came with this idea of settled colonialism, this idea that came with the papal bulls of doctrine of discovery that said that people of color were only half humans and that any land that they came upon, they could take and they could convert these folks but conversion wasn't necessary because they could also kill them, right? So these were my ancestors were enslaved at both of these missions, Mission San Jose in Fremont and Mission Dolores here in San Francisco. They are reminders for me of the first prison industrial complex in California. Mm -hmm. This is the place that we created our own prisons and were enslaved at. For 99 years, these missions stood here. And then, where did we go? Well, Mexico decided that, <clears throat> that, uh, that they wanted this land and they, 
the missions had too much. And so they would secularize these churches and they would take over sw big, huge swaths of land. And people like Peralta owned all of Alameda County. And my ancestors became um, indentured servants to these big ranches. And so we didn't go back to any land. I think one of the funny things is, is that when people came here and these myths of who, people, who we are continue to stay in our minds, we're taught this stuff in third grade and then we go away. Ohlone people aren't actually Ohlone people at all. Um, when folks first got here, they called us Coast Noan. They said, these people that are on this land kind of look alike and they kind of eat the same foods and they kind of uh, dress the same. And so we're going to call them Coast Noan. But there are actually eight different nations of us with eight different religions, eight different creation stories, eight different languages. Our songs and our dances are different. Not, all, not every Ohlone will do. We all have these different places we come from. And even with our, in our own language base, I spoke Chochenyo when I got here. My great-grandfather, Jose Guzman, who died on Peralta land in 1938, was one of the last speakers of that language. Even within our language base, we're not the same people. We have smaller groupings of people within each of those places. And so we don't have these huge tribes, right? We have these places, uh, we have family, gather, family getting, gatherings. So this talks about Mexico, um, a, a land that continued to be enslaved, enslaving our people, uh, the people that were indigenous to this land um, and to many other lands that um, was taken over. U.S. won Mexico-American War and the land was stolen for a third time. Right, and instead, um, and um, instead of slavery, now it was about mass extermination. So the United States has already started, right? And their Western expansion brought them to our lands, and they were creating treaties with other Native people all along. But by the time they got to California, it was not about creating treaties anymore. It was about killing every single Indian you could find and taking that land, right? We always talk about this wonderful idea of people coming and finding a way to get here because of gold rush. They were rushing here for gold. But I also tell people that not everyone found gold when they got here, right? But the state of California was created upon making these laws, these policies against indigenous people that made it illegal to be Indian on our own land. Five dollars a head and 25 cents an ear. They would steal the children from villages by killing off the parents. It was creating this disconnect from the land and our ceremonies and our people. And it did that for quite a while. So we're talking about people here in California, indigenous people from this land, having to find those pieces back to home again. Finding ourselves landless within our own landscape of territory. So Cal, oh, that's just talking about that. We'll move past that. Even after the killing stopped, there was these policies of children being taken to boarding schools. So my mom and my aunties, my uncles, were some of those people taken to boarding school. They went to Chamawa Boarding School up in Oregon, taken hundreds of miles away from your home, unable to speak your languages anymore, mixed in with children from all over the country, learning how to, uh, how to be white, right? So it was about trying to beat the, beat the Indian out of the children, to take them away from their land, to disconnect them from their ceremonies and their people. And so um, after that, there was something called foster care. And this is a, a story that I learned not that long ago from an, my auntie who's 80 years old, and she lives in Oakland, and she had seven children. And uh, she told me this story two years ago. I was sitting in her living room with her daughters, two of her daughters. And she begins to tell this story about how she went to boarding school and how... Um, at about 12 years old, she was taken out of boarding school and put into Indian foster care. And Indian foster care isn't what we think of today. F 
foster care for Native students was about putting them in white homes, the girls, to be nannies and caretakers of the households. And so at 12 years old, she was placed in a home in San Leandro. And she was watching these, this family's children. And she said, that family was really nice to me, you know? They really um, wanted to take care of me. And they were so nice, they wanted to put me in school. And the city of San Leandro said she was too dark. And so she wasn't allowed to go to school. So she worked for them until she was 14, and she married my uncle, and they had seven children. We began to remind people that we're still here. What does that mean? Up until about 20 years ago, most people thought Ohlone people didn't exist. Um, up until about 20 years ago, it was because of folks that were really able to come out, and go past the historical trauma, really get angry about stuff, and talk about we are still here, working through those kinds of things to talk about how the land had been taken, how we had not been, how we had been disconnected from our language and our ceremonies for the last 200 years, how it was important for us to tell our own truth, how it was important for us to make those decisions to go into schools and tell children the truth about Junipero Serra to tell the truth about the missions that, that had happened and what that really meant. So what does that mean now? So today, I work on saving and protecting the sacred sites of my ancestors, and I thank these crazy people who must have been um, in my, in, in my ancestors must have been in their ears. This guy in 1909 named Nels Nelson created this map of 425 shell mounds that ring the entire Bay Area, my ancestors' cemeteries and village sites, so that we could find them today, and we could preserve and protect them and know where we're supposed to lay down our prayers. Emeryville and Shell Mound, then and now. So the Emeryville Shell Mound was the largest of all 425. It was on an 1856 Coast Survey map, so that people coming into the Bay could see it. And it outlasted uh, most places until UC Berkeley um, decided that they wanted to know what it was and started to take it down and still hoard hundreds of my ancestors' bodies inside of their museums and underneath in uh, lockers and boxes. Um, today, uh, this is what our Emeryville Shell Mound looks like. Because of commerce, they've decided to put a green mall on top of it in 1999 and we fought against it. And this is what tells our story, a little three foot uh, hill with a metal basket that's supposed to represent thousands of years of my ancestors. This place, this funerary complex was so huge, it was over three stories high and three and a half football fields in diameter. But we're gonna put a mall on top of it. We protect our sacred sites by going to different places when we need to. And so in 2011, um, after fighting for 12 and a half years to save the sacred site along the Carquina Strait, many of us came together and we, um, we asked folks to show up, and they did. For 109 days, we took over this sacred site that was about to be developed by the city of Vallejo and their Greater Vallejo Recreation District. Um, and we, were, we had Homeland Security watching us, the Coast Guard off the edge. Um, we had people all over the place. We thought we were going to get arrested, and we didn't. And because we stood up for 109 days, we were able to talk, uh, we were able to get some relief. On day 99, a federally recognized tribe came in and paid for a cultural easement, the first cultural easement that was created between a federally recognized tribe, a city, and a park district to preserve and protect that site forever. And so, So we fast forward. Uh, this is our stuff on uh, on no sainthood for Sarah. We lost that one, but we keep moving on. So the West Berkeley Shell Mound is the oldest of all 425 shell mounds. It's the very first place that my ancestors lived along the bay. It's the very first place that babies laughed and cried. It's the very first place that we fished and put a tule boat into the bay. It's under risk of getting developed upon. The top is what they wanted to do. It's a five-story building, and I'll tell you there's actually a, a little update on that. 
people can't actually understand what it is that, um, that there could actually be a different vision for some place like this. It's the last 2.2 acres of land on 4th Street and um, that actually is open. So a friend of ours came up with an alternative plan because the zoning board could only see what they saw and said, well, let's give a quarter of this, a little tiny spot, and we could say this is for Ohlone people. And we said, no. Um, but this is a different alternative spot that could actually daylight the creek and put an arbor in that hasn't been on our territory for 200 years, recreate a mound that would actually not dig into the ground that people could go into and have a theater that would actually, a 360-degree theater. I'm getting, I'm going to that. going, one minute, one minute, one minute. <laughs> so how do we decide to work on doing all of this stuff, right? Um, I have this good friend who's on the panel, Beth Rose Middleton, who wrote Trust for Land, right? Uh, no, Trust in the Land. I'm oh, sorry. Um, who invited me to this meeting a after I came out of the Segorte takeover and uh, my mind was still fuzzy and I was dealing with PTSD and couldn't read a book or watch TV but I went to this meeting on indigenous land trust and I had no idea why. But I believe my ancestors moved me to do the work that I'm supposed to do and I listen and I'm obedient and so I did it. And so we came together, Janella LaRose who has been my um, supporter and work and we worked along doing all of this uh, this work for 20 years created the first urban indigenous women's land trust in the Bay Area uh, two more minutes I know it says zero I'm gonna take two more two more minutes uh, sorry because uh, I have to complete the story this this bottom picture right here is the first land that was given back to us about a month and a half ago. So it's important to know that this is an indigenous women's-led land trust, and why? Because we are the matriarchs of our communities that we have, because of colonization, have been taken out of that place. That we made decisions and have relationships with the land that is different than men. And I don't care where you look in the world, patriarchy and misogyny has really screwed this world up. Women's connection to the land is because we are, we are the medicine carriers, we are the water singers, we carry, we carry life within us. We are not trying to find equality with our men, we are trying to find our way back to our traditional rightful place. And I think that it's important for us to look at how we tend this land because this land is not just for the Ohlone people. This land is for everyone that now lives in our territory. It's a place to reconnect because every human being needs to be connected to land. And we have lost that. When we walk on this cement and asphalt all the time, we lose our connection every single day. So the West Berkeley Shell Mound actually had something happen last week. There's a new law that Skinner, Nancy Skinner and Scott uh, Weiner pushed through and, it's, and this developer is invoking this law for the very first time that does not go through an environmental impact report. It actually gets rubber stamped. So we had been in consultation with them for six months. We had gone through the drafting of our process with them for two years. We got hundreds of people to speak in public comment, 1,800 letters on our behalf. They had five. And so right now, we are in this place between 60 and 90 days. The city of Berkeley has to give an answer. And it doesn't go through a process. And so we're in a kind of a freak out mode about this right now. I'm going to encourage people to come out on the West Berkeley Shell Mound on 4th and University on Tuesday morning at 8.30 a.m. where we will do a spring equinox prayer and we will have an interfaith prayer service there. People are welcome to come. I think it's important for us to show our strength that there are more than just native people that are standing for this land. That this land is also, that when we pray at this land, that those ancestors are hearing those vibrations and that it's not only to protect us, but to protect everyone else. I do this work today because I have grandchildren and I'm running out of time. If we do not protect these sacred sites for them, then the genocide will pretty much be complete. 
We need to have our sacred places intact. We need to have a place to pray. We need to have those spiritual points. And so I offer you the opportunity to stand with us. Oh. I hope.